when somebody did something inappropriate on the elevator. Good thing I had this on. But it actually around helps on the fan. Yeah. So that's why I had three of these. This is my last bottle. Are we good? Is that a you can use that. Like this? No, I don't think it's that. This is Blair, the interpreter. Is 
the meeting started because I can't hear anything. Folks, I'm sorry. I think there's an echo because the MTA HQ room and the PCAC camera are right next to each other. So they're just, the sounds are bouncing off um, one another. Is somebody talking right now? Because uh, it's you can't hear anything. I'm sorry. I, it's, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're getting IT real quick. Just give us a minute. Not that one then. This one? No. I unmuted it. That's not muted. Deck one, two. Can you hear us? Yes, it's much better now that the PCAC um, audio is off and that everybody in there's room is off. Yeah. Their audio. Perfect. Great. Everybody hears us now? As long as the computer sound is off, it is. It is. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. It sounds much better. Sorry. Okay. With no feedback. Yeah, no, it's good now. Yep. Um, so after after uh, the governor and Chair Lieber thanked all of the transit employees yesterday for the job well done on April 12th, was then um, the regular MTA press conference where the chairman answered a host of questions on various issues uh, ranging from safety and ridership to um, fare evasion to just about any topic you can possibly think of that came up during the meetings. And um, I'm not saying this because um, I'm an MTA board member, but I think Chair Lieber did an astonishing job at responding to each and every question. Um, I think he was really right on in the in, for the reasons that we need to stop fare evasion. Uh, we are now facing upwards of, and I was shocked because pre-pandemic, the Inspector General estimated the fair loss at $300 million. Mayor Lieber estimated it to be $500 million now. And it's no surprise to anybody that the people who are committing the heinous crimes in the system, the vast majority of them do not stop to tap or swipe or uh, insert their Metro cards. So if we can stop this massive fair loss, which actually hurts the poorest people in our city the most because it means more frequent and higher fare increases, or God forbid, service cuts, um, we will stop a good deal of the crime and we will make sure service is maintained. We must maintain service. There were several issues brought up about weekend service and how it is suffering, likely because of all the GOs, but there are still some staffing issues. Chair Lieber addressed the staffing issues and said we are much closer to having a full complement of staff However, I have experienced, as I'm sure many of you have, on weekends, uh, if you're on a line where GOs are taking place and service is slow, because service is running slow, that means there's gaps in places. So we need to address the weekend service issue for sure. Uh, many speakers brought that up yesterday, and uh, the chair has assured us he is looking at that. Um, yeah, go ahead, Bert. 
Um, question is, you keep saying, and we've been saying it for a long time, we've got to stop the people that aren't paying their fares. What are we going to do about that? Well, one of the most encouraging things the chairman mentioned about stopping fare evasion was a redesign of the entry system, which former President Byford and I talked about uh, years ago. Um, it was it changed the way people enter the system. Right now, it's too easy to get in. Um, I've seen people at non-attended entrances wait for two or three or four trains before someone uses the slam gate and then they rush in. I have seen families have their children go under the uh, turnstiles, open the slam gate, and the whole family goes in. Um, I've seen really athletic moves over the turnstiles that <laughs> people would be very proud of. They should be in the Joffrey Ballet. I mean, I've or seen... Or the Olympics. Or the Olympics. So it, it's too easy right now. We must make it... People, the people who pay can get in really well and easily and not reduce throughput, because throughput is obviously important. But we can't have the sieve that we have now. Um, yes? You didn't talk about that Blue Ribbon Committee. That I'm about to. Oh, but that Let answers his thing. question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm about to. Yeah, but that answers his question that something is being done. Yes, indeed. And to the, to, the, to the end of looking into fair evasion and what can be done, the chairman has appointed a blue ribbon panel. Uh, it may not be the complete list of names, but it's a great list of people, uh, including David Banks, the chancellor of the Department of Education, Matt Fishbein, uh, former executive uh, assistant for the district attorney from Kings County, Michael Hardy, uh, National Action Network, David Jones, uh, Community Service Society and MTA board member, Roger, Ma Roger Maldonado, uh, former president of the New York City Bar, Melva Miller, uh, excuse me, Melva Miller Association for a Better New York, Abney, where, where the chairman was speaking, Rosamond Pierre Lewis, uh, McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research, Kate Slevin of the Regional Plan Association. Michael Sonberg, retired judge uh, in the criminal court system. Natalie Cantero, a senior VP of Innovation Partnership for the City of New York. Zachary Tuman, adjunct professor of international and public affairs at Columbia University. And Joanne Yu, executive director, Asian American Federation. It does say addition, additional members of the panel may be added at a later date. So I'm they're looking at this. Again, One you, second, please. Oh, please. Oh, okay. This is a good time to say. We need to follow rules of decorum here, okay. which means that we have to let our speakers speak, and at the appropriate time, we'll take questions. When we take questions and put it in an orderly way, that means that we'll call on people individually and have a free for all. We have a very tight agenda. I'm sure that people are heard, but that means we can't speak over people. And Um, it, it's really uh, important that education be part of this uh, redesign of the fair, uh, the need to pay fares and let young people understand what it does to the system. If we don't get this, uh, don't get these funds, how it hurts them, their families, their fellow commuters. Uh, how it means we might get less and less service because the deficit will grow year by year. Um, obviously, the MTA needs additional and recurring sources of revenue. We can't balance everything on the backs of riders. Um, the chairman has stated that. Um, rider advocacy organizations have stated that. It's obvious to anyone that looks. Um, the fare uh, recovery ratio of New York City Transit is really high compared to other systems. We are paying a greater percentage of the cost of the ride through the fare box than Long Island Railroad, Metro North, or New Jersey Transit, or any of our or many of our fellow uh, transit systems around the country. So that's that's good, but we need to get the riders back. Um, the fare capping program on Omni helps that. That's being taken up in huge numbers when Omni is widely available and reduced fares are available on Omni. It's going to pick up when the machines in October are located in the stations. Omni usage will definitely pick up. I, I have seen the, uh, the card available at more and more drugstores and convenience stores, so that's a good sign. But um, we need to get riders back. 
and we need them to be safe and feel safe. Um, so I will also mention that the mayor has come out big time on safety. Um, it was pointed out to the mayor's office that they have seen police in the system, but they are all staring at their phones, um, or there are groups, too many uh, clustered together. We will certainly have a chance to address uh, Chief Wilcox today, but um, the mayor has also asked that anybody who sees this situation and sees police officers staring at their phones to take a photo of that and send it to, and they, the mayor has issued a, uh, an address, and we have that address, should anybody choose to do that. Now, it is true, many descriptions of perpetrators are sent via the phone. Um, many just uh, updates for the police officers are done via their phones. So there are, <laughs> you know, potentially lots of good reasons for officers to be looking at their phones. Maybe not each and every time, but I'm sure we will hear from Chief Wilcox today how often the police officers get notification of somebody in their vicinity or they're being dispersed to another area. Um, I remember um, some of our members, uh, I think both Sharon and Karen, have pointed out they have seen large numbers of police officers together. In one of those cases, at least I recall, it is where there was a transit district and they may have been being dispersed. But we need to hear about all of these from the chief, which is one of the main reasons uh, I asked uh, Chief Wilcox to be our guest speaker today, and I think uh, he will answer everything. We will all be polite, respectful, and we will wait for the chief um, to answer the questions we have. The questions will be for our members uh, only. The press will not be asking questions of the chief today. This is for us. The chief made that very clear. Um, let me move on. Sorry. Uh, we also have. We have. I'm. I'm almost done, Trudy. Uh, and then I'll take questions. Um, we also uh, are noticed, have been noticed that um, there is track replacement going on in lots of places in the system. And one of the places, and we don't have the start date yet, will be the three stops on the, um, on the J line, the Parsons Archer, Sutphin Archer, and 121st Street. Service will be suspended for several weeks between those stations while this important track replacement job is, is undertaken. There will be a shuttle bus, obviously free, from uh, 121st Street to Briarwood, uh, Jamaica Van Wick, Briarwood Station, uh, and people will be able to transfer to the Queens Boulevard line there. And very excitingly, there will be cross-honoring of Metro cars on the Long Island Railroad from Atlantic Terminal to all stations in Southeast Queens, which is kind of our freedom <laughs> ticket taking even greater effect. Unfortunately, it's when something important is being done. We would like to see it all the time, obviously. But this will help riders who utilize the J-Line and who will obviously be inconvenienced by it not going any further east than 121st Street for many, many weeks uh, to get to their destination uh, safely and efficiently and possibly even more quickly, uh, depending on where their ultimate uh, origin and or destinations are. Um, Trudy, your question. Well, I have two comments. First of all, somebody, I don't know, somebody at this table said who is she? Rosamond, besides whatever her organization is, was the former deputy borough president uh, under Scott Stringer and was also, and was all, and also when he was controller. And she, one of Thing she handled for, with him was this whole question of fair beaters because it was a very big thing for Scott. So I think that should be noted that it's not just appointing people from out of the blue or because they happen to belong to some organization. Right. That's number one. Right. Number two, you left out, unless you're going to bring it up later, something else that Kathy announced yesterday, uh, which is about the Q70 bus and the uh, LaGuardia. I'm getting to that, but okay. That, yeah. Yeah. Because I, that is, but, but also the way the media handled it afterwards was very discouraging because she said it was going to be a free ride now to LaGuardia you know, all the time, and the way they handled it is, is 
really, you get a free, you get a, the only way you can get a free ride is from 74th Street, but anybody who takes the bus or, or a subway to get to 74th Street, I'm, I'm just repeating Well, of course. Said. The free and, ride is to the it, airport. It's not to the station where you get the Q70. Of exactly. Course. And which is what you have anyway, because you have a free transfer. I'm just pointing out to you that you may want to know that because I watched after. Right. But let's keep in mind that the Q70 also goes to the Woodside Long Island Railroad Station. I, I am not saying that I am, that is, I am just reporting the way that it was treated mostly yes. in the media because after watching the board meeting, I mean, virtually going okay. to board. Okay, we, we have to really speak yeah, succinctly exactly. today. Exactly. We have so much that's going all on. all I wanted to, Thank you, to, to bring up to I would just add that the M60 is just as effective, if not more effective, than Depending the Depending on your origin or destination, yeah. absolutely. The M60, if you're going to uptown Manhattan or, or uh, Harlem or Upper West Side, that's the way to go. But yeah. there's no free ride on the M60. No, there isn't. But by the time it would take you to do the but free thing and go... It pays you to take the M6. You miss, you miss, whatever. Andrew, uh, yes, Chris. Um, I'll be quick. Andrew, uh, when you mentioned the gates, we also need to remind that when an accessible person is going through the gates, they have to be really careful. And Deborah mentioned this last month that when she tries to go in, you've you got a friend always running or hitting her or any walker or stroller. So we need to make that very clear. It's not just one person, it's also accessibility for seniors and people with disabilities also. And when they look at new entry, that will absolutely be taken into Yes. And I had, okay. I had this morning, I had the meeting with Carmel Q. We were talking about it today. About okay. That. Stuart. Yeah. So, this panel, are they going to examine social issues or are they going to examine technical issues? Because if it's limited to that, then maybe if they're not doing it already, there needs to be a Um, they are going to you know, be looking. They, I know for a fact they're going to be looking at other systems. Because we discussed that here. At this, Absolutely. At this group, and we talked about the configuration, the height, the width. Um, but is it going to present that to that panel, or they're going to be looking at social issues that are causing um, people to. They're, they're supposed to look at every aspect um, from education early on, um, what, what it means. Even the chair mentioned that people are starting to feel like idiots when they see people next to them. I remember many years ago at a fair hike hearing on Eastern Parkway uh, at the Brooklyn Museum when a woman got up in tears and saying, you know, I want to do the right thing, but I see all these people going through the rear door and I think, what am I, an idiot? Why am I paying? So that's an issue that, you know, respect for your fellow riders. That needs to be taught early. Okay. And as we have here at the body, knowledge for the system, Absolutely. And uh, Jano, has, Chair Lieber, has told me he will be in touch with me on a regular basis during this. Um, you know, France and very different configurations. Yeah. Several systems in France. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay. Um, our, our speaker asked me what floor we're on. I told him so he now knows where we will be when he arrives at 1 o'clock. Um, oh, yes, please. Um, the, uh, the, the chair has also indicated that he is open to looking at considering other panels. Um, so, you know, it's not, a, it's not a closed group, although it is a group that is um, vulgar and human. Uh, so, this will be, but I think that you know, they, they understand that there's always the opportunity to learn more. Um, he is loving the RPA is on that, and they've done a lot of work. Let me just add something which I should have said earlier on the safety discussion. Uh, many of the public speakers and others have called for uh, more cameras um, in on the train. The R211 fleet are camera ready and will have mm -hmm. cameras. Many folks are asking that the R179s, which are brand brand new, <coughs> arrived late but they're still new, should be uh, 
have cameras installed on them since they will be here for a very long time. Um, also, they are moving ahead with CBTC in many different places. We got a presentation on um, CBTC on full 8th Avenue line, uh, even more on the Culver line, and um, I asked because we had gotten a demo at one point of um, ultra-wideband frequency, which can be put on any cars and which is much cheaper and quicker to install, if that would be also used in the system, and they said it absolutely would be. So this indicates that not only the newest cars, which they are, which come CBTC ready, or are in the case of some being retrofitted to be CBTC ready, but other cars that aren't ready to be jumped yet could have ultra wideband installed on them and thus benefit from the CBTC technology via ultra wideband. Yes. Good question. Um, Karen. Okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, in terms of the makeup of the blue ribbon pack, I'm assuming that everyone there takes transit. <laughs> I, I sure love to assume that, and I know I know several of those people personally, and that they do. But I cannot vouch that everybody does. But I will ask the chairman. Okay, I think that's really important. It's we very important. Okay, I was going to have a lot hate relationship, but they have to. Um, and the other one, is, the other question is. Um, you mentioned that you know you hope that younger people will understand the implications of you know fair evasion. Do we have younger people represented? I was just curious as again the makeup of the people from the community. You know, I just want to know, making sure it's a wide array of people. They mentioned education and going to schools and various institutions, the house of worship and everything, and speaking to people about it. And Andrew, maybe uh, I can answer. Maybe that. they're not represented on the panel. Andrew, no, but maybe I folks can on the that. panel supposedly do represent people that do what you're suggesting. But can, yes, I, can I answer Go that? Ahead. That's why David Banks is on the panel, and he will be dealing directly with the schools. Yeah, the and chance. he will also be going as he goes to the schools if things come up, or if he, if he feels that there should be somebody, you know, from the as the, as things come up. He will be that. That is the reason. There is a reason why each person was put on that panel. It wasn't just a, you know, oh well, I, I'll give you a title, I'll give you a title, or your organ. I like your organization. It was put together very carefully. But that's why, because I asked that question when I heard about David Banks. I said, what does he got to do? And it was explained to me. Thank you, Drew. Yeah. Okay. That's helpful. Uh, Chris. And, yeah, Andrew, uh, just speaking about the, the ribbon committee, are they going to be also asking any disability groups to go on? Is, is that you uh, know, as I said at the end of my listing of the members, mm -hmm. additional folks may be added to the committee. Uh, so um, it's not a final list of, of people. It is the current list of folks. And I will be kept up to date on all of this, and I will keep you all updated on where the committee stands. Um, I was told at one point I was going to be on it, but now I'm not. So uh, we will see. Because the reason why I'm saying that, Andrew, because the excessive for seniors or people with disabilities who do use the subway, and I agree with Sharon saying very strongly, they need to see on different areas when people are trapped. So we need I got the distinct impression that every user of the system and potential user of the system is going to be represented by this panel uh, because that's the whole idea, to get people comfortable and and, uh, and work as a team and work as a team and respecting their fellow riders. Stuart, did you have something else? Yes, um, just a follow-up question. I just hear about the panel, so I'm ignorant today. It's unusual. The uh, timetable, did they say when they would be producing something or getting back with results. I have not heard a timetable. Right. Because I think we need to find the answer to that because the needs are immediate and, you know, if this is a dog and pony show. Trudy might have an answer on the yes, time frame. The answer, the answer is, is, is that they're going to start meeting um, next month, yeah. which I guess is this month already, um, almost, and that they will have a report um, sometime 
before uh, in September or October is what I've That's pretty good. That's a lot of meetings in a, in a not so long yeah. time. Yeah. All right. we got to yeah. do something. I mean, it's, it's, it's in the moment. Right. Right. But you need some action that's happening that's before that's September. That's why they said they were going to sit around and talk and play and with each other. Depending on what they suggest for the fair entry system, we want to get it in the in the capital program, obviously. Mr. X. Okay. Members first here. I did, I did, and I'm sorry. We need to be polite here. We have no tolerance today. Thank you. Questions? Okay. No. Thank you. Talking about cameras, yes. may I, I? I've discussed this with both you and Lisa because when we came out with our statement um, about, you know, we uh, right after the right after the incident, I think we were the first to come out with a statement. Except it wasn't our statement, and my phone started ringing as soon as it came out because, and I can't help it. People associate me with the MTA, and they associate me with the PCAC forever and ever, maybe because I've been doing this for over 40 years. And, and they all wanted to know, since, we, since they said, Trudy, you all proudly said that you've got all this money for cameras, and now we find out they're not working. So this brings me to a point which I have brought up with both Lisa and Andrew, which is that whenever there is a statement or a press release, when possible, sometimes it may not be possible because you get a mic stuck in front of your face and you got to say something, but when we're putting out a statement or when somebody is testifying on behalf of us, I think it would be very helpful and useful, at least for me, I don't know how everybody else feels about it, that that a draft or that the statement or the press release or the letter or whatever it is be, be quickly, quickly sent to all of us so that we have a chance to at least review it or look at it before the fact. If we see something that's wrong, then I would have, then, then we should immediately call back and we can be given a time limit whether it's an hour whether it's sure enough. I'm sorry. whether it's a, it's an hour or whether or it's anything else but I think it's important since uh, that that these things are put out on behalf of the PCAC and we are all uh, at all okay, the, I think you made the, point. the PRC that we that we know what's coming out that's my feeling. I've discussed it with both Andrew and Lisa. Okay. And I just like to respond. We don't always have time for that. As I, as I responded, we also have a speaker who is coming on at 12:30. So we're running late on this. Yep. Um, we we don't have time to to run by um, to, to run by everybody. I was especially by our on a position um, regarding that. That was something that we did. If we didn't put a statement out, that was yeah. respond very quickly, I will say that we did not have to be the first group, individuals or anything, that had something to say what was going on in 35th Street when we didn't even know 
exactly what had happened or with the cameras. I'm, and I will say it again. It is sorry, my feeling. Wait a minute. Well, then, well, I... When when can we do it? Let's go back right now because we have a guest at 12:30 and it's 12:40. Can we just go to new business? Let's business. let's hope that we can get through efficiently and we'll have time for a discussion okay. afterwards. Otherwise, okay. We're gonna, uh, okay. But we have people waiting yeah. and we do have a tight schedule, as Andy Byford might say. Okay, we so have, we do have um, our first. We do, speaker. and um, you may recall that there have been a number of proposals for. Um, rail service to LaGuardia Airport. Um, some of them have been our own. Um, I have my own ideas of what I'd love to see. But certainly the idea that you go way beyond to Metz Willis Point, um, I understand the reasoning behind that particular proposal. Uh, it wasn't going to uh, inflame various neighborhoods uh, who are sort of, sort of fighting against an extension of the NW route although there are other permutations of that that might satisfy those neighbors. But in any event, uh, Scott Spencer of Ameristar Rail is with us today. He has a, a proposal um, to get rail service to LaGuardia. Um, he also has several proposals for Amtrak service, but we're not getting into that today. So without uh, any further delay, Scott, you're on. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate the invitation I have to uh, speak before the New York City Transit Riders Council. And I know how important this meeting is. The chief is expected. I'm going to do what I can to compress uh, my remarks so we can get you back on track. But I would want to share uh, first my condolences and my sorrow for the crime that is confronting the New York City transit system. I know we're all passionate about the success of transit and how important it is for our freedom of ability, peace of mind, and ultimately quality of life for those who live and visit the city. I just wanna give you a quick remarks because I've seen these challenges before. Uh, when I was a manager at SEPTA in the mid eighties, there was a sense with a number of horrific and horrible crimes that we had lost control of the system. But we implemented uh, four P's of, po of policing that is worth reflecting on because they, they would still be effective today. That is uh, zero tolerance of petty crimes. You mentioned fare evasion, of course, sales on the train, even foul language. Why? Because behind the petty crime we confronted, normally there was some want or warrant for an individual. The word got out very quickly, even for petty crimes, they were going to be uh, confronted. So a lot of people had prior wants and warrants uh, disappeared from the system because they were being confronted. Of course, plainclothes police. There, I, I, the police worked a great balance between those in uniform and being plain clothes to find what people were being exposed to. Proactive sweeps of uh, homeless. You know, we have to care for the needs of the homeless, many of them mentally ill. But unfortunately, stations are not a safe place for someone who's homeless or has mental illness. And certainly, trains should not be mo mobile homeless shelters. So we did proactive sweeps with professionals to get them the care and where they needed to be. And then we publicized the results every week in terms of the number of arrests. And eventually as the crime went down, the percentage of crime went down. I can just tell you, we got control of the system. And this is before we even had cameras available. So it can be done. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, the chief today because his remarks will be very important. With that, I'll shift to what uh, we can uh, look forward to for an option for uh, the future of uh, air train to LaGuardia. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen just to confirm that this is uh, up there. Um, are you able to see now the... Um... Yes, we see it. We see it. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm gonna flash through this presentation. This is what we gave to the Port Authority of New York, uh, New Jersey, and some MTA officials uh, last month. And, um, it's a, a proposal that was developed by Ameristar Rail. You can find out more about us at ameristarrail.com. We also uh, partnered with um, Foyt Albert, who's a architect and engineering firm uh, based out of uh, New York, as well as James Corner Field Operation, uh, also based in Manhattan, but they also led the design of the uh, Manhattan's um, High Line. So uh, our new AirTrain LaGuardia JFK system solution 
can be implemented in three phases. The first phase is a operation of a dedicated New York City air train, LaGuardia trains right through the spine of Manhattan on the existing uh, end route uh, from lower Manhattan, ultimately City Hall, operating express to Astoria Dittmar's Boulevard. There, it would connect with uh, shuttle buses to each of the individual LaGuardia terminals. What's important about this phase one of the solution, it can be implemented this year because it uses existing trains, tracks, stations, and buses. Some of the features and benefits is the trains would run every 15 minutes, giving you a running time from points, some points in Midtown, less than 30 minutes to LaGuardia. Um, you would have various amenities on board the train. Um, and then this would be the fastest way to establish all electric zero emission rail transit in LaGuardia because we can implement it using electric buses this year. And by the way, uh, this solution that we're talking about in three phases doesn't preclude some other uh, solutions that are being considered, such as uh, uh, dedicated bus lanes for the Q70, upgrading the Q60, even the ferry service could be done in complementing the solution we've developed. So keep that in mind. Uh, some Scott, of the design and engineering. Scott, some sorry to interrupt yes. you, but before you take this slide off and go to the next one, um, you're proposing this be express service with just the stations that we see on the map, correct? That's, that's correct. What happens when those much faster trains catch up with other trains on the same track? Okay. We, we can get into uh, operating analysis, but this is using existing slots. And as far as uh, we've looked at this, uh, this can be done without catching up on other trains. But there's other ways to do this if we have to go all local, or we could take the existing end trains and just do that. So okay. uh, it's subject to this evaluation, but it's not anything that we know of as a showstopper here. Um, and then, uh, as I said, we could start as little as 90 days from, from go. Um, phase two would be uh, building a air train LaGuardia from the Astoria Dittmar station through a LaGuardia to a station in East Helmhurst. And this neighborhood station uh, we're proposing to be called Lewis Armstrong East Elmhurst. It's, it's within walking distance of the Lewis Armstrong House Museum but it adds a neighborhood station to serve the needs of the neighborhood. And also the stations at A, B, and C terminal would be accessible to the neighborhoods. Um, Wildflower Studios is uh, interested in a station where they're developing in Queens. But the anchor to this phase two is to build a new Amtrak Metro North station we call New York Astoria Exchange Station. This would be the first new railroad station in New York since Grand Central was built in 1913. And all Amtrak trains and the new Metro North Penn Station trains would stop here. And this would be built on the air rights above uh, the existing tracks of the Hellgate Bridge approach. So it would be very little impact on the neighborhood in that respect. And um, it would give us also another benefit to the neighborhood is along the alignment, we would build the air train sky trail to give a number of recreational and commuting benefits. There's a lot of bicyclists who bicycle to their jobs at LaGuardia. And uh, I also want to just point out, there's a lot of push for extension of the NNW to the airport, both this route ver verse, as well as Grand Central Parkway because of the 275 fare. But you know what? By us building a separate air train uh, where you would transfer on the same platform as Storia Dittmar's, no elevators, no escalators, just roll ahead on the same platform to the air train station, you could still have a 275 fare. There's fare technologies that would allow that fare to be honored even on a connecting air train system. So it doesn't preclude that. And there's two other big benefits to this. If you extend the N and W uh, trains, you're going to be dragging a 10 car train through the neighborhood, the noise and impact of that is significant. You don't need 10 cars in the LaGuardia. You only need one or two cars. So it's much more efficient with this transfer to go to the air train technology, which is quieter, only two to four cars. And the bridge structures have less impact on, on the neighborhood. We'll show you that in a minute. And um, it uses the same air train technology it would provide connections at air train, uh, the, um, 
Astoria Exchange Station for services uh, for people traveling from Southern Connecticut, Westchester, the Bronx. Even the governor's proposed Interboro Express could be incorporated in this to provide a game-changing access for those coming up from Brooklyn and other parts of Queens to be able to transfer right here as it goes on to, Brook, uh, to, to the Bronx, to transfer to Story Exchange Station to get to, um, to Airtrain, uh, to LaGuardia. And so this would be very beneficial um, to the neighborhood, particularly with the new recreation, the High Line in Manhattan, but this air train sky trail would allow bicyclists to use it because it would be so wide. And there's several Scott, design Scott, engineering. Can, quick, yes. Scott, we have a quick question and an important one. Trudy, go ahead. Yes. You said you presented this to various MTA people, to the Port Authority. But as you know, the, it was the governor, who, the current governor, who, who stopped the former governor's air train plan. And she has made it very clear. I don't know if you heard when I, we talked about her proposal right now for a transfer between the M70 and, and the subway. Yes, it's free. Okay. And all I want to know is have you presented this to Governor Hochul or any of her people or the State Department of Transportation? The, those the, we will have the final word. No, you're okay. correct. You're correct. If you go to our website, ameristarrail.com, look at our latest proposals. You can get the copy of the letter that went oh, to the I'm governor. Yes. Yes. I don't want it. I don't represent the governor. I am asking no. a simple question. Yes, has we are going to do that. Yes. Has this, has no. this been he presented? He said they are going to do it. No, but we've been it. told... We've been told it will be arranged. We're going through representatives of the state Senate and the assembly. They're working on it. No, but yes, no, they no. know it'll they be done. Are, excuse me, the governor has an office and I would strongly yes. suggest that before you go any further, because she has made it very clear both publicly and privately, and even yesterday when she discussed the transfer, that she, yes. that she does not like the idea of an air train. So. Right. Wouldn't it make sense for you to go to the governor first? Not the legislature, not anybody else, but to we the have. governor. We have. We've gone to the governor. Yes, we've gone to the governor. She's very busy. She's had this since December. But in the meantime, we're doing Thank meetings you. like this to listen and learn from various other interests. We, don't, we want them to hear from us rather than just the governor. So, yes, we are working on that. With the time remaining I have, I just want to point out to you that we have um, advantages with this system to minimize impacts on the neighborhoods way the stations and the bridges will be designed. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Phase three then builds out air train from the Lewis Armstrong East Helmer station through Metz Willits Point, and then along the Van Wick Expressway to connect into the existing air train at Jamaica. This will provide three new stations for transit in Brooklyn, in addition to Metz Willits Point, Jewel Avenue, Briarwood, and uh, it extends the air train to operate as a through service to uh, JFK. Features Scott, and benefits of this, yes. Those are new stations in Queens, not Brooklyn. Oh, I, I misspoke, thank you. New stations in Queens, Jewel Avenue, Briarwood, and uh, Metz Willits Point. Thank you. And then this will create a seamless passenger transit system uh, north and south through uh, Queens to uh, LaGuardia, JFK. We'll have the only major airports in the world connected by a one seat rail transit line that provides airport passengers and workers convenient access to both points. It will, this, this solution will have the most dramatic reduction in traffic and parking congestion in, in Queens. Uh, I've heard many times about the number of people parking in the neighborhoods there. And anybody coming from Long Island will have a transfer either Jamaica or Metz Willis points to LaGuardia on this system. And then it will create a benefit for Queens with uh, one of the most remarkable linear parks in the world, the Air Train Sky Trail, 10 miles long from Astoria to Jamaica in terms of recreational and commuting opportunities uh, for, for residents. There's a number of design and engineering considerations, but one of them is the sky trail will uh, help reduce snow and ice accumulations on the tracks that would be built above the tracks uh, like that. Now, 
there's three signature elements that we think would be beneficial to the neighborhoods. One is bridges. We don't want to see all the columns along the Flushing Bay promenade or driven into the neighborhoods there in Astoria. So there's a number of soaring bridge designs that will be very attractive and distinctive for the neighborhood. But as you can see, they minimize the columns that have to be driven into the neighborhood. And those few columns can be driven by technology we know of push driven or auger driven that are very quiet and reduce vibration to minimize impacts on neighborhood. Other signature element is the stations, really remarkable opportunities to enclose areas where people shop and work as they've done here in Europe that can be part of a, a very attractive uh, improvements uh, for the neighborhood and the businesses. And the third signature element besides the br bridges and the stations is the AirTrain SkyTrail. We all know how transformative the High Line has been for Manhattan, as you can see here. And already extensions of the High Line are being built. We foresee these opportunities for uh, Queens to be just as beneficial. And these are examples around um, the uh, around the world. And that's why James Corner Field Operation uh, has been brought on board as technical advisors because they were the success for the High Line in New York. I like to summarize, and I know we're running out of time here, the community benefits for the new air train LaGuardia JFK system solution. It's going to provide rail transit for Queens neighborhoods at seven new stations, and it'll provide enhanced access to Flushing Bay via the Sky Trail and the new Lewis Armstrong East Elmer station. The new Amtrak Metro North station at Astoria Exchange, it's gonna become the back bay of New York. Boston has two stations. New York's the busiest and most successful Amtrak station in the country, only one station. Now all Boston to Washington Amtrak stations would stop in Queens. Again, benefiting the neighborhood because of air train being built here. The 10 mile long linear park, the air train sky trail, as you can see from these aerial photos will create Instagrammable moments for residents, visitors, tourists alike throughout Queens, providing bike and pedestrian access to LaGuardia airport workers. And of course, this will provide rail transit uh, service as well to both airports for airport workers, providing both SkyTrail and rail transit access to Met City fields for events and jobs. As I pointed out, all Long Island Railroad lines will have rail transit access to the airports. And uh, LaGuardia and JFK rail access to the New York region will dramatically reduce traffic congestion, noise, and pollution in Queens neighborhood. And as I pointed out, the governor's plan of the Interborough Express could be accommodated and extended to the Astoria Exchange Station on its way to the Bronx, providing improved rail tra uh, transit access for Queens and Brooklyn neighborhoods. There's a number of revenue streams and funding sources, which I don't have time to get into right now, but are unique to this plan that helps pay for the plan. And uh, Mayor Star Rail, um, I was responsible for developing the startup and operating plan for the first railroad extended to a US airport in the United States, SEPTA's airport line. So there's a lot of that innovation incorporated in this plan. As I said, Fort Albert, they've been involved in both LaGuardia and JFK projects. And James Corner Field Operation, remarkable what they've achieved with the High Line in New York and uh, around the world. So I'll summarize this. Why choose the new air train LaGuardia JFK system solution? It will provide the most comprehensive rail transit access for the New York region to LaGuardia and JFK. As I showed you in phase one, we can begin air train LaGuardia service this year. It will provide the greatest reduction in traffic congestion and pollution in those neighborhoods. Creates a major new transit line serving Queens neighborhoods, Flushing Bay and City Field. The Air Train Sky Trail, it's a linear park that will provide remarkable recreational benefits for communities along the Air Train route. It's gonna provide the best transit access for airport workers to both airports and it will provide the fastest way from Midtown to LaGuardia via the Penn Station nonstops, both Metro North and Amtrak to Astoria Exchange Station. It's just 10 minutes from that Astoria Exchange Station to Penn Station. So this would be remarkable. It'll create a single ride rail link for both workers and airport passenger connections between LaGuardia and JFK, whatever there's flight diversions or connections. 
LaGuardia will be connected to Newark Liberty Airport directly by Amtrak from the Astoria Exchange Station. And it will create new real estate, commercial and utility revenues to attract private financing. So the bottom line, this solution is a bigger, bolder, better air train solution for New York. And so with that, I know we're up against one o'clock. I'm trying to run this train on time, but I, if there's still time Thank available, you, be happy to answer any questions. We, we have, I'm sure, tons of questions, but we don't have the time for that today. So I'm hopeful that you could uh, either come back to another meeting or we can email you the questions uh, yeah. because I myself have at least four or five. And you All right, I'll give you... Probably I'll give you my say, email address and I'll put it in the chat. My I email have, address is srspencer at ameristarrail.com and I'll put it in the chat for others. Well, thank you, you very much. Probably, I appreciate this opportunity. Probably, Scott, you should probably say links LaGuardia to Newark Airport air train because once again, you, at Newark Airport Station, you'll have to get on another air train. And right. again, may I suggest <laughs> that before you present to us again or anything else, that you make an effort, a, a concerted effort, to contact the governor's office and see if she will, if anybody on her staff even will meet with you. Because unless it has her approval, and especially with all the financial, the building and the construction and everything else that you've talked about, the money has to come through the executive budget. And if, otherwise, it's a great idea but it's just there are wonderful ideas all over the place. So well, I thank you for the reminder. Yes. We we have reached out. We will meet with the governor, but I know from I one contact we have the governor. She, she will want to know what do other people think. So this is why this conversation today and others are so important. But yes, we will look forward to letting you know as soon as we have that opportunity to uh, present to the governor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank and you we so will much. share your presentation and um, your email address and we'll get We'll, we'll try and corral the questions first. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Hello, Chief. We are uh, extremely fortunate to have our guest today, uh, a very, very timely speaker for everything that you have been hearing about that is going on. And um, this is a very special day for the Chief. It is his 35th anniversary. anniversary with the NYPD. Thank you. Thank you. 1987, for those that don't know. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Um, obviously, there's been a lot in the news the last few days. Uh, the mayor and his statements and a host of others. You heard them at the, at the MTA meeting. So, um, we'll let you uh, start your presentation, uh, or you can enjoy your cupcake, whatever you prefer to do. <laughs> okay. And... Uh, Fire. Just leave some time for questions because I know they'll be settled. All right. So, you know, I want to thank you for uh, the invite, Andrew, Absolutely. and thank you for, for having me. Yeah, I mean, certainly it is, uh, the timing is significant. And, you know, I wanted to take it, advantage of this moment to uh, come out and uh, meet you, to talk with you, but uh, more importantly, to listen to you, to, to see what you have to say what you're feeling, what your needs are. Uh, you know, I, I spoke to the committee board um, on Monday, and, you know, I did a lot of talking, uh, but now I really want to hear, I just want to do a lot of listening today. Um, so, you know, just a couple things that I mentioned at the board meeting, that, you know, we're working very hard this year to really make, uh, Coming out of COVID, coming out of the difficulties of the last few years, trying to make New Yorkers and those that visit the city feel safe. And on the on the subways, um, you know, the subways. I grew up in New York City. The subways are what bring us together. Whether no matter what community you're in, um, who you are, or where you are, you know, the, the subways are uh, a great equalizer, and they bring us all together. So protecting the subways, um, not just from crime and disorder, but also from terrorism, you know, uh, certainly we're reminded of that a couple Tuesdays ago, um, is of paramount importance. <coughs> so from, from day one, um, you know, my arrival here was, again, somewhat timely. Uh, January 15th, I know everyone remembers the horrible crime of Michelle Doe being uh, pushed in front of the train in Times Square and killed. 
I responded to that incident uh, then as a, as in the detective bureau. And I, I responded, and I was there for that incident. And uh, 10 days later, I'm, I'm here. So, you know, it was a quick turnaround. So just coming off that incident, you know, you could feel there was a, a palpable feel of just uh, anxiety uh, and, and fear. And my goal from day one was to sort of uh, really Chief, maximize. Hold it one sec. Okay. Thanks. Just to sort of enhance, multiply, and maximize our visibility. That's what. I've really been trying to work hard on. Um, we're doing uh, transit officers, precinct officers, housing officers that are coming into the system to do um, vertical patrols. We're really, really trying to end our presence and make it felt uh, throughout the system, and not just in Manhattan, but but everywhere. And you know that's of critical uh, importance to me. So. Uniform presence, um, high visibility, and, and uniform train patrols. Those are the, the top two elements that I've been pushing. And then, you know, we also have the mayor and, and, our, and, and our subway safety plan, and you know, we're certainly emphasizing key elements of that. One is a greater attention to quality of life. You know, we've done a lot in the last few months to really address quality of life. Obviously, theft of service. Uh, you know, we, we, we've uh, our focus on theft of service. Um, we have over 20, over 24,000 theft of service summonses this year. It accounts for about 79% of our total summonses. But that's not all of it. I've really been emphasizing quality of life summonses on the trains. And you know, what am I talking about? Smoking, drinking, urination, outstretched. Um, disorderly conduct, things of that nature. So that's something that I'm really staying very, very focused on. I talk to my, my district commanders constantly, my borough inspectors constantly, and that is a focal point of what we're trying to do. Our tab summonses for quality of life are up like 126% in the last month, up 89% for the year. So we're staying very focused on that, and we're going to keep keep on that uh, just moving forward. So it's all about, these are the trains, right? So it's all about moving forward. And that's what we're trying to do. So obviously crime is always of a great concern. I look at it every day. Uh, I, I know transit crime. I was in transit for seven years. Um, where I got to meet Andrew back when I had, I was the inspector in charge of transit Manhattan. But the last, Proud nine years I've been in the Detective Bureau. But I do understand transit. You know, I, I grew up in Manhattan. I, I never, I was a city kid, so I took the trains and buses. So I, I get it. My family takes the train. You know, I, I'm trying to get into the system all the time. And I know it's the lifeblood of, uh, of our city. And it, it, and it is absolutely a key element to, uh, to the comeback of New York City. Which, as a New Yorker, I've lived in New York City my whole life. I totally believe in it. So I've seen the ups and downs of New York City, as we all have, but I have no doubt, no doubt in my mind that we're, you know, we're, we're going to rebound again, and the subways are going to be part of it. And our transit cops that protect the subways are going to be part of that success as well. I have no doubt about that. So just one thing that, you know, I, I know there's a lot of focus on the increase in crime, and we're not dispelling that, but one thing, a measuring stick that I do look at is where are we versus pre-COVID, and when you look at certain indicators, overall, like major crime, when you go back two years, we're actually down 13% in crime, major crime. When you go back three years, we're actually down 2%. When you go back five years, transit crime is down about 8% in major crime. So I know we're struggling right now with what we faced last year, which was a lower threshold, but as the ridership comes back, more people are coming into the system, and, and, and we're experiencing some increased volume when compared to where we were last year at this time. So that's what we're, we're battling. But, um, you know, one thing that 
we've done a lot of uh, work this year, every night, and I'm, and I'm particularly proud of it, and it's hard work, is our coordination with um, Department of Homeless Services, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, uh, the nurses and clinicians, the Bowery Residents Committee. Uh, we formed really a strong um, multi-agency partnership, and we work every night, literally seven days a week every night to uh, get out there and try to uh, assist the homeless, get them service, get them shelter. And, you know, we do this literally every night at the stations throughout the system, and we also ride the trains with some of these uh, joint response teams. So I'm very proud of that partnership. Um, you know, I talk to Commissioner Jenkins all the time. Actually, we spoke about midnight last night on a situation. You know, and uh, and that's that's part of being a partner. You know, you know he he feels comfortable to call me with a problem, and I feel comfortable to call him with a problem, and we try to fix it together. You know, so just in those in that collaborative effort, what we've done with them, NYPD, we take you know there's been over 1,300 uh, referrals and placements of homeless people in the shelter. And that's not since January, that's since February, the end of February. So you know, in a short time, you know, we've done a lot of work. We're going to do a lot more work. And we all know when it comes to the homeless situation, there's a lot more work to be done. So we're committed to that. Um, back on March 19th, we created a subway safety task force, a small unit, a dedicated unit, um, under the direction of Captain uh, in my, she uh, very um, well versed and experienced executive in the transit bureau. Put her in charge of it, and she's addressing on the overnight and in the evening sort of aspects of the subway safety plan, quality of life, significant quality of life issues, but also almost a lot of the people in that unit have prior homeless outreach experience. So they're dealing uh, with that, and they've taken an additional almost over 400 people from train stations, train platforms to shelter. So, you know, I'm, I'm proud of that as well. Um, I mentioned on Monday, and this is really new, we, we just got out of uh, the last graduating police academy class 67 new police officers, created a subway training unit for them. It's called STU. So the chief of department allowed me to do this the, the job. The department had kind of moved away from that concept, which is when I came out of the academy, we went to a training unit as a cohesive unit, and we learned together and we moved together. So in the last few years, they've been sprinkling them out from the academy to different commands. I asked, can I go back? Yes, keep them together, teach them together, mentor them together, and, and let them grow together. And they were always allowed to do that. So. We created a subway training unit. Those young officers are out on patrol now in the evenings. So you're going to see them in the rush hour up until about midnight. Um, you're probably going to see some out of Coney Island this year and, and some other other main events that might happen. You know, there'll be uh, um, parades or whatever in the transit system. But one of the key elements that we're tasking, tasking them with is um, I call it MBMD, which is multi-borough, multi-district train runs. So we want them on the trains. I want them visible on the trains. I want people to see them. So they're they're going to be doing multi-borough train runs. So they might start at 59th Street, Columbus Circle, but they're going to take that A train out into Brooklyn and then come back. Or they might get the D train and take it into the Bronx and come back. Or they'll take the 7 train from Hudson Yards and they'll take it out into Queens come back. So that's a key element. Um, might have gotten away from that in the last few years, but uh, um, we want to make sure that uh, we're, we're teaching them how to do that. And you're going to see uh, in the coming months additional uh, aspects that we're going to put out to enhance train patrol. Train patrol is, is the key element. Uniform train patrol is the key element of what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, so, I mean, you know, again, I, I probably talk too much. I don't know. But I want to, uh, again, 
So um, I'm very fortunate to be able to come back to transit after all these years. You know, I, I learned in my in my the years away, I learned a lot. So I, I learned a lot of things in the detective bureau. I I, I oversaw. So many different aspects, and I oversaw so many crime scenes. I was the chief of Bronx detectives for five years, which was very important to me because I live in the Bronx. But just to be able to, to work in the Bronx with those fantastic detectives, I learned so much from them. And then I was uh, then chief of detective Shea, who would become the police commissioner, brought me down, and he put me in, a, in charge of a, a division that I oversaw other units, including crime scene unit and, and some other aspects. And the last few years, I've been overseeing the transit squads that, that, that actually oversee crime and transit, investigated um, some other units like that, major case, arson and explosion, just some of the units that I oversaw. And some of that uh, comes into play here. You know, we, we mentioned that there's, there's been a lot of uh, fires in transit lately. There's an uptick. And I've been able to kind of plug into my old network of those detectives in Austin explosion, and they've done a great job trying to help us. We've made a lot of arrests actually this year uh, on people that were setting the trash trash cans on fire, or other other uh, things on fire. So that um, very serious issue that we take very seriously. But uh, you know, I'm just going to open it up to any thoughts uh, or, or comments you have, and you know, so I can answer your questions. And I'm sure there are plenty. Will be the, uh, the moderator here. Okay, okay, sure. Wonder, I just want to um, first thank you. I just want to sort of reinforce the rules of the road that we started with, that um, we're going to have our members ask questions first, and Andy will call on the yeah, members. Yeah. Um, we have members of the public who are on the committee. We have some members of the media who are on the so um, the media, I'm not taking any questions from the media. I have uh, I have deputy right. uh, yes. the CCI with me. Yes. They can reach out to them and we'll, we'll take uh, questions. From them. So just want to so we're going to end a call on them, um, and then we will, um, if, if people who are, are members of the public would like to raise their hand, um, we will take you after. Um, but we'll interest members of the public in the room with members of the public who are on uh, the Zoom. We do have some members of the council on the Zoom also. Okay. Okay. Andrew. And we know who they are. Bert? Uh, sir, I don't want to outdo you 35 years. I've been a commuter on the subway system for just to get out for 74 years. Bert, can you speak a little bit louder? Okay. I, I've been a commuter for 74 years, so I have a couple years more. How, how do you plan to put the Officers on the trains, and the method that would get them to do the most good. by station, by riding, or a combination of stations. Combination for sure. So I mean, the key thing is we want to get them on the trains, riding with the public, see them, they feel the presence, and they make them feel safer. So it's a combination. There's no one answer to that. Some are short train runs. It might be from Columbus Circle to 125th Street, but we're emphasizing, particularly with our younger officers and other aspects that are coming down the road, to do much longer train runs. You know, uh, it's an old uh, transit concept of the TPF, the Train Control Force. We're looking to sort of reinvigorate that concept. So, you know, we want our officers to be on the train riding with the public. To, to Bert's question, when officers are in a station yep. and a train pulls into the station, are they told to look on the train while it's standing there and see if there's anything going on? Or do they stay just on the platform? So what we want, and, and most transit officers know to, know to do this, is to obviously you want to make sure that the conductor sees you the motor man sees you so they know you're there, and to always, you know, it's, it's a rule of, of the transit road that you always, you, you look in the cars and, and you make sure, and you're watching the cars as they go by to see what's happening. You know, that's what transit officers have done for many years, and we try to emphasize that. You know, we have a lot of precinct officers that come in to the system, which is sort of a new initiative for 2022, 
started back in January, and we've had like 3,000 vertical patrols from precinct patrol coming down into the into the into the train stations. You know, we want them to be visible. We want them to stop at the booth, so the booth knows they're there. To go down to the platform and to look around and, and stay there for a little while. So that's you know, we always want to emphasize visibility to be looking in the train. Um, there's another thing, another method that we do, which is called TOMS, Train Order Maintenance Sweeps, which is a little more to what you're talking about. And that's really a transit thing, and we've done 55,000 of those this year, where you might see a supervisor with several officers spread out. They'll let the conductor know, we're here, we're going to conduct TOMS, hold the train, doors open, and then we'll go in throughout the line and look in. So that's another aspect of what we're trying to do, uh, just to be this. Bill, Maris, 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 Maris. Okay, Marisol, go ahead. Hi, Chief. It's it's good to see you again. I know I know you're from the detective squad. Um, I think Andrew already kind of asked the question. I wanted to know how long do you stay on the station? Um, we've received we've received. Hold on a minute, please. Nancy, please just give me two minutes. Um, if we can just know how long they stay on the platforms. I've been getting complaints regarding the D line and the two. And five trains, um, they're saying that the, the officers are not staying on the platforms long enough to really observe what's going on. And this mostly happens during the, the later hours. Uh, so I just wondered what what's the strategy for the overnight? Because a lot of incidents are happening during those times. And again, how long would the officers stay on the, on the platform when they're... And do they receive complaints or are they just responding in general? I know that's a lot of questions, sorry. Well, I'll start with the last question. Do they receive complaints? They're, they're, they're police officers, so their job is to be there and to handle anything that might they might either come across or is brought to their attention. So yeah, they're there to be police officers and do best conditions for sure. Um, so, you know, I mean, obviously, so you know the Bronx, it's, it's divided into two transit districts, 11, which kind of covers sort of the west side of, of, of the Bronx, and the stadium going up to Long Avenue, and then you have District 12, which covers sort of the east side of the Bronx, as you get the two and the five going up, uh, and the six going into, like, uh, you know, Pelham, or uh, up into the fourth. So, on top of that, and I mentioned those 75 verticals, you'll have we have uh, precinct portables coming down and doing verticals. They have a sector car, so they're not going to be with us all night. They'll be with us for a short period. Their job is to come down, stay as long as they can, put eyes on the station, and make sure everything's all right before they resume patrol. The transit officers mix, where we have some officers that might be assigned to that post the whole night, or they're assigned to train runs the whole night, or, or a partial, like a four hour extended, or, or things like that. So it's really a mix of, of all of those three. Some come down for a short period, other officers are assigned um, for the whole night, or a part of their tour. It, it's really a, a blend of everything. Um, the, the D and the two, I'll, I'll bring that back to, uh, you know, to those district commanders. We'll, we'll, we'll rely on that. We just actually from earlier Bronx Cops at this morning where, you know, always in a mix. Um, so we're fortunate. I, I think I have very, two very, very good commanding officers up in the Bronx, and they know their conditions really, really well. Um, the overnight, I, I know the overnight I used to do when I was a cop in the fourth floor, I did, I did midnight. So I it's always a, a concern. So part of the subway safety task force hours, they work from 6 p.m. to 4 in the morning. So we're trying, and I have additional officers moving into those hours coming down uh, soon. So I'm trying to beef up those hours, those overnight hours, for sure. Thank you. I definitely appreciate all of that. Thank you. Uh, Stuart. 
Um, Two-part question. Uh, when you're very encouraging what you were talking about today with different commands now assisting, you know, in the Housing Bureau and um, borrow commands, yeah. Yep. And, and the new are you still having any human capital shortages? Are you still down in the spring, even with this? So, you know, um, depends where you look. I mean, you know, it depends how far. You know, we're slightly down from where we were pre-COVID, um, but but getting that 67 offices was definitely a, a shot, a boost for sure. And there's an academy class in there now, so. I'm hopeful, and I, I am certainly uh, I've had conversations with the chief department. I'm very hopeful we're going to get additional officers uh, very soon. But you know, uh, attrition is always something we we fight with. It's not just the police department; it's any agency. So, you know, uh, there's been a lot of retirements, and, and over the uh, the last few years, uh, and, and it's the nature of the beast. Officers get promoted, they become detectives, they get other assignments, and Constant ebb and flow, and you're always trying to backfill for the future. I'm in a good spot right now, but you know, obviously, you know, I'm not going to say no. You know, if they offer me more police officers, but just the uh, the added coverage that I'm getting from patrol um, is so valuable. Second part of the question: So we're talking about the uniform. Yes, your predecessor. Plain clothes. Plain clothes operation. Yeah. So, so and, and with new administration, right? New leadership. So we do have we do have some plain clothes officers right. that are really um, geared towards home um, crime fighters. They're geared towards fighting you know felony crime. You know, the, those are the ones that I want to get out there to fight robberies, the pickpockets, sex offenders that right. Well, that's really, you know, where we're, we're focusing them. You know, are they just strictly staffed and dedicated to your bureau, or are you incorporating others from other commands? I'm talking about, when you're talking about plain clothes and transit, we're talking about our officers. Only your, no. The officers that are coming down on verticals are in uniform. Right, that's why I asked if you're, you know, yeah, you're trying a strategy, or you're trying other strategies with plain clothes from other commands. We're not doing that, no. but you know, we do have a small contingent of, you know, we do plain clothes, but it's geared towards really fighting crime. Chris? Uh, yes, Chief, one thing I just wanted to add. One, you know, with I, where I live is Transit 34, and I do see the office there, and I have to say Transit 34 does the job, but when I go to another borough, I don't see the safety on a train station, like I'm going to say Jamaica, because I know Sharon can vouch with me as well. Uh, you got a lot of people that like to smoke at the Jamaica station where the Long Island Railroad is. And half the time, I can't even get off that platform because, and I know a lot of people vouch with me, I can't even, if I'm bringing my mother with a walker or someone else who has a wheelchair or a stroller, they can't get out safely. And it's like people... When they see us opening the gate or use our harder gate mode, people like to run but don't give the courtesy to a disabled person. And it's not just in Queens. It's almost every borough. And they don't have respect. I'm used to students, but now it's the adults. And it's kind of, you know, you think about it, the students have a little more manners than the adults. So can we uh, try to work on that issue? That's my first question. So it goes back to kind of what I touched on at the beginning about us giving greater attention to quality of life offenses. You mentioned smoking, right? Yes. So that's one of the that's that's a that's an, a quality of life offense that affects others on that train car. So and that's the platform. What, and the platform. Uh, I'm talking about anywhere, but okay. definitely on a train car, but on a platform as well. So this is. This was in the first few weeks that I got here. I had, I had conversations with President Craig Cipriano about that. And we made that, I made that to all my precinct or district commanders, 
an area that I wanted them to focus on. And we've written over 1,900 summonses for that smoking offense this year. And we've ejected others for that as, for that as well. So, yeah, I get it. And, and we're definitely looking to, uh, to target that. It's not in any way acceptable in the transit system. And we're going we're gonna to stay focused on that. Uh, there is one concern that I hope we can do this work on together, but mask, if this mask is still in effect, can we please uh, try to work together yep. on that? For sure. You know, so certainly it's a little confusing when you read the papers or like yeah. what is yeah. and what isn't, and, you know, so certainly the, we understand, the trans officers understand in the system you're supposed to wear your mask. What we, maybe sometimes the policing officers who aren't really wearing masks anymore, you know, as they're into, driving around in the sector car. Sometimes we've seen some issues with that. But uh, listen, you know, I, I think we're all looking forward to that moment or that day where we don't have to wear masks anymore. We can kind of get back to normal. But we're not there yet, and we're certainly not there yet in the transit system. So um, at least for our transit cops, we're, we're going to emphasize that until, until the last day. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of things I wonder about, too. Often, when I, and stations all over, when I see the, the police officers on duty, they're just standing somewhere, and they aren't necessarily standing by the slam gates where they can monitor jumpers. They aren't, I wonder why they can't be walking back and forth down the platform or well, really being be. more visible they other than be. just sort of loitering. They should be, because... Um it's, 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 a, it's an old-fashioned concept. It's called patrol. And what? Patrol. <laughs> you know, and, and it's not a new concept. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with you. You know, I want officers to be moving around, to be on the platform, to get on a train, to get off the train, to walk around, to go up the stairs. But they aren't. <laughs> well, we, you know, we're not going to stop emphasizing it. That's what we want. We want and that's a part about what I'm talking about with visibility. You know, we need to be visible and we need to move around. I agree. And the, and the, um, the other thing is, what is the responsibility of the police officers in terms of, of fare evaders? Are they supposed to be monitoring that or not? Yes, absolutely. Well, 79%, 79% of the summonses we've issued this year, I can't hear almost you. 80% of the summonses we've issued this year in transit are for fare evasion. And I'm talking about... 24,000 that we've issued for fare evasion. We saw, I believe, I'm just kind of going, like last week, was, we had a 60% increase in fare evasion summons. The last four weeks, the last one, 38% increase in fare evasion summons. We are focusing on it. But we're striking, the, the balance that I need to strike is fare evasion forces uh, focusing on that, but I also need them on the train. So, it's a constant balance that we're trying to, to, to find here. We're not not ever losing sight of the fare evasion. We can't we can't lose sight of that, and we're not gonna. But we're also not gonna lose sight of that people need to see us on the trains. So we're definitely addressing it, and we're there's, gonna continue. To. There's one particular place, and that's the where the air train connects to the J E. Oh, Jamaica. Yeah, there is not never not, not a violation there because people come through the slam gate and open it with their luggage to get out. Yeah, I Yesterday I saw 20 way. people go in, and there either are people, you know, that's happening, and then there are also people selling fares, you know, and buying fare cards there. I don't know why there isn't a permanent officer stationed at that place because it's Never not being violated. So I know at that station there's a there's a mix of that's transit district 20. It should be some of our officers. But I know there's also NTA officers. Well, that, that work maybe or port authority or, or but you know, that's transit district 20. I will revisit that and see what we can it's do. A bad welcome for tourists who get off the uh, air train and come into the subway and then encounter with Sharon. I, 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 I dread getting off the air train to go through because I know I'm going to have to encounter all this lawlessness. Just we'll look at it. We'll look at it. Yeah, and, you know, this is probably more about uh, the cycles of crime and psychology of crime. Why now? 
any, like, two and a half years since the pandemic, you know, ridership is, was suddenly coming back. I know you have, like, different levels. You have, like, you know, the homeless and they're reacting to various changes. And then you might have, like, some kids and groups and, you know, they're doing prankish things. But then you have, like, people, like, who are just targeting people, opportunistic crimes. I'm not quite sure, but it's like they're all happening together. And I just feel like the anti is just increasing. And I'm just, is it just, I'm just trying to make sense of it, and also, not that it's your job, <laughs> I'm just trying to make sense of it, but also wondering, you know, this whole chicken and egg scenario, but as more people come on, is that really, or just people are just, there's a shift, and people are just, they don't care, I don't know, and I'm maybe not expressing myself very well, well but well, that well, probably represents, you know, my feelings right now, so. Nobody <laughs> right, them. so, I mean, one of the things I mentioned earlier was the broader context, so, where we are right now versus where we were last year at this time, we're definitely seeing an increase. But where, where we are right now, when we look back to pre-COVID levels, we're actually slightly down from those prime levels. But one thing I did notice, and, and I mentioned it at the board meeting, of uh, you know, our increased um, felony assaults, which is worth like 33% of felony assaults this year. And probably 40% of those involve a cutting instrument which is very alarming. Yeah. And when I start to really look at those assaults, and I read them all, a lot of them began as a dispute, an argument. Uh, you stepped on my shoe, or you bumped me, or you shoved me, or there was a dispute at Wall Street where it turned into a stabbing, which was over a seat. Yeah. So as the trains are getting crowded, maybe people aren't used to those crowds anymore, and now that sort of close contact is sort of becoming a dispute, leading to, you know, you know, we had a shooting the other night at Parsons Archer, yeah. which started as a dispute and quickly turned violent. Um, it started as a physical, as, as a verbal back and forth, led to a fist fight, and then unfortunately it led to, you know, deadly consequences. Yeah. But that started as a dispute. So that's certainly part of the equation that I'm seeing, at least with assaults. Um, like the robberies, the, the muggings, and, and I noticed like the purse, like I know in the past when people have stolen purse, it's like snatch and run, but now it's like violence to the ground, wrestling, kicking, and so I see like this intensity right. that I haven't seen, so that's concerning as well. Right, right. so just, we, yes, we've seen an increase in robberies this year. Again, when you look at the COVID period, we're actually down 22% versus the period right before COVID hit. So, but down 22% in in all numbers, not per uh, per. We're talking about robbery. We're talking about robbery. Right. They weren't as violent as they are now. So, right? listen, I, I used to run Central Robbery. All of our, to me, are, uh, every robbery is violent. <laughs> That's my philosophy. You know, I used to be in the detective bureau. I ran Central Robbery. So. We are making arrests for robbery. So I'm just going to tell you, like, we're up 43% in arrests this year in robbery. And that's a mix of our officers who are right place, right time, or they would be able to arrest the offender, but also the great detectives we have in the transit squad who used to work for me. They're fantastic. <coughs> and uh, they know how to get out. They know the system very well. They know how to navigate. They know where the cameras are. They interface with the MTA to get the video quick. They get the posters out to the media quick. They get the water flyers out to the cops quick. And they do a great job, and we do it well together as a team, and we're making a lot of arrests for robbery. But, uh, you know, robbery is something very, very, uh, something that really I focus very hard on. Thank you. Uh, I have two unrelated questions. One is a, a follow-up to Karen's question which is there not as an increase in above ground felonies, robberies, crime so, also, and isn't it just because the subway, I, I mean, I've spoken to some cops and about this, that there is more attention to this, what's going on below ground because it's a concentrated area. And I wonder how you feel about that. So, so you're right, yes city is experiencing, as, as a total, 
an increase in crime this year. So, and transit crime accounts for about 2% of the overall city's crime. So the, the city's crime has gone up this year, and we have not been exempt from that. You know, we, we've also experienced increases. Would you say that there's more attention because it's a concentrated well, you know, rural it, areas, it, rather way, than saying the streets, you know? <laughs> well, it's a big city, you know, yeah. for sure, but the focus on the subway system is not new. It, you know, when I was in transit in Manhattan, anything that happened in transit is magnified, and, and yeah. we know that, you know, because one, it's so important. And it, it is a smaller environment. It just gets it gets a greater amount of attention. And you know we understand that. So the greater focus is not something that you know I see as adverse. You know, um, like if something happens at Central Park, there's a great it, it's sort of magnified. Exactly. And so if something happens at Times Square on the train station or Parsons Arch or it, or anywhere in the transit system, you know it's magnified. You know, the, the event that happened in District 34, 36th Street, is, is a, was a horrific act of terror. But it happened to happen at 36th right. Street, you know. It could, and, but it could have been anywhere. It could have been anywhere, and and that's what our officers are trying to defend against. You know, we're, we have a, our own internal anti-terror unit. Um, we're actually in the process of building a Brooklyn anti-terror unit right now. Um, that's coming, hopefully, in the very near future. We'll be able to announce that at a future board meeting. And that my second question, which, I, which is what I was going to ask you about, is um, when you've been talking about um, fair evasion, um, uh, smoking on the train, yep. whatever, and I was reminded of one of your predecessors way back, and I was wondering if you had any contact with him because he has always had his his broken windows theory, and I'm talking about Bill Bratton. Sure. And I'm wondering were you, if you were around when when he was around at transit before he became well, the, the, the Uber commissioner, you know? Well, 35 years, so yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, 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 so. so yes, uh, so when you go back to when, uh, I, I have to call him Commissioner Bratton, because that's how I know him. Commissioner Braden came to transit police. I was a cop in the 44th precinct back, back in the 90s. Yeah. So by the time I came to transit, he was not in transit anymore. But obviously, he becomes the police commissioner, and I get to work for him in that capacity. But uh, I've, I've spoken to him. Um, you know, obviously, uh, his knowledge of uh, policing is unparalleled. So uh, you know, to, uh, I always. Always open to any advice or you know uh, that you might give us. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to call on you one second, please. So, speaking of former um, commissioners, I was on my way to a, a meeting here when Chief Delatore was the head of the Transit yep. Division, and I happened to be entering the 96th Street and Broadway 123 station at the 94th Street entrance, which is a sieve. Uh, oh, well, I know yeah. that. Uh, I grew up while I was talking to the chief, at least nine people went through the planning. <laughs> um, he had an idea where if you get so many cab summonses, you're considered banned from the system. And if you're caught again, you're considered a trespasser, and then you could actually be arrested. Do you think a situation like that could work? So there is a system in place where you can be listed as a transit recidivist where you, would got, you wouldn't get a tab summons, you would get a, a criminal court summons. I see. And then there are other... How many do you have to have to, to get that? I'll get that to you. I don't have it exactly. Okay. Well. But the, it's actually, the, trans, the MTA kind of registers you as a transit recidivist when we would run your name. So you wouldn't be eligible for the tab. You'd have to get a criminal court penalty. So the concept of uh, particularly violent criminals in transit, whether they could be banned, has come up. Nobody currently banned. Um, under the current system, uh, we had talked about in the past, when I was here, when Chief Hall was here, about sort of a trespass concept where you would be uh, notified that you're not allowed in the transit system, maybe a certain, 
officer. Now, is there a stipulation to force where you could be potentially arrested for trespass? So that's concept uh, probably geared towards the most violent recidivist transit criminals, but uh, it's something that I've had conversations this in the last few months with Chief Delatory about that. I've also reached out and talked to another prior, prior transit chief, Chief James Hall, about this. So it's not it's not a concept that I've put away. It's something that's in play that I'm talking about. Obviously, the MTA would have to, to do a trespass. They would have to sort of be the uh, complainant on that, but uh, certainly being talked about. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you. So uh, I want to piggyback off that and then ask you another question. So um, does it, why does there need to be some kind of legislative action? in order to bring people from the system that there was some reluctance to do. Uh, but I think I would have to be ordered by a, by a judge. Okay. So, you know. That was great. Um, we're to um, and then my other question, so the other day I was on a, on a subway and there was somebody who was um, being, uh, violating one of the rules of conduct and I reported it to the person at that booth. Um, and I, Hopeful that they that they you know radio this forward. Um, would that be something that your that officers would then need to train? If somebody reports it, how does it happen? Some you know we're encouraged it to. Was it on the train? Oh, oh yeah. You know I when I this this guy was sleeping, he was definitely served in some way. Um, shoeless, crashing about. Oh, yeah. Got up, went into a corner, did his business went back, lay down, started thrashing again, and then everybody just moved. And I got off and went up and reported him. So, um, so something like that, obviously, and I mentioned that on Monday, you know, please, something like that lets somebody know what you did as soon as possible. You're letting an MTA employee, whether it's the, uh, somebody on the train crew or at the booth, they put it over their six wire. And if it's a, Serious situation, which that sounds to me like an emotionally disturbed mm -hmm. person, that gets routed immediately to 911 through the six wire, and that would come over as a radio call for that district. And one of the things that we do in transit, and we do it pretty well, and we coordinate with MTA, we call it spotting the train. Mm -hmm. So if we know that was the number two train that just left 96th Street and Broadway going south, we work with the MTA at the rail control. I have a sergeant 24 hours a day at rail control. Their job is to coordinate things like that or a major event. And what we can do, and what we do do, is spot that train and let the six wire connect with the train crew, and they'll try to hold it somewhere down the line so we can get to it. That's, that's a critical. We've we got to spot it, and then we've got to stop it so we can get to it. You know, if we don't do that, then it just keeps moving on to Brooklyn, and we can't, you know. I report things like that to Inspector Porty all the time. He has somebody to be trained. Yeah, he tells you. Okay. So what's the best? From Andrew again. Right, right. But the best way, because I don't have him on, because I don't know him and I don't know him. Is to tell somebody. Tell somebody. Tell somebody, listen, obviously, if there's an officer in the system, let them know first. But let somebody from the train crew, because they get on the six wire, and it goes right to rail control, and the rail control let us know if it's a quality of life issue, it won't go to 911, it might go to 311, or the, the sergeant of rail control can alert the desk and say whatever district it is, and we can kind of do it that way. But what you explained to me sounds like an emotionally disturbed person, which is a 911 call for sure. The Thrasher Express. Well, I, I think you probably would have taken it out of time. Uh, Stuart, and then we really need to take our visitors. We have several yeah. waiting quite a while. So before uh, it came, the council was talking about other businesses. They were discussing the blue ribbon panel thing for the derivation. Um, any demographic or home characteristics about the people you're citing? Are they youth? Are they the homeless? Do they fit any patterns? Uh, no. We were. <laughs> Listen, our job is to be fair firm and of course the board you know that's that's what we're that's our goal that's our goal we're not seeing any patterns about who's committing these uh, 
you know, we we uh, we apply enforcement one where we see violations and where you know we have our offices. So whether it's Times Square or Barclays or wherever it is, that's you know if we see offenses or that's where we conduct enforcement. So in terms of demographics, you know, I'm not I don't really have that in front of me. I don't it's not something that we I know the MTA looks at it, but our goal is to be to address conditions and be fair. Or any segments of the population, you know, like is it youth, is it homeless, is it uh, yeah. any group? No, no, I'm just, you know, the statistics are a different story. I don't know. That's not something I'm really going to discuss. i take some of our visitor uh, questions. Uh, Yes, we have one in the chat that asks if it's possible to use um, different, you know, department-issued cell phone cases to differentiate um, uh, official phones from personal phones. That's not really for me to answer. The, the cell phones are giving out are given out to us from the our IPB and public our information technology bureau. That would be something that they would. Look yeah. That's the, you know, I'm sure you understand where the exact question comes from. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Jason. Uh, hey, Jan. Uh, sorry that I couldn't join you guys. Uh, hey, Ken. Hey, Chief. Uh, several, several of, of, I'm in Jersey City joining the, the poor authority uh, meeting. A uh, couple of things. Uh, one, I have seen uh, more police presence aboard trains. Uh, most recently, uh, early this morning, when I was going home on the end train. But at the same time, uh, there was people smoking aboard that same train. So what? What could we do, Chief, to have uh, more police officers aboard our trains? Let's say, because I got on uh, Whitehall Street and these uh, police officers were already aboard this train, but they got off at Court Street. So what could we do to uh, let's say have uh, already police officers ready at court that they could uh, alternate the other police officers that they have to like get to uh, Manhattan. Like for instance, from Transit District uh, 30. Right. So, so the sort of the, the dance of the train, train runs you know, obviously, I want to get as many off moving train runs, but at some point they get off, and then the goal for me is to get as many cops on as many trains on as many tours as possible. And you know, sometimes they'll get off, and then you know, you, you'll stay on. So but I want to something. Hey Jay, it's definitely something we're looking for. Uh, and I'm trying to uh, get on to longer train runs. Sure, that's uh, that's something that's very important. To me. I understand, and the smoking thing I, I mentioned uh, already, we're, we're addressing it. It's uh, it's unacceptable behavior. Not, no matter where it is, what on the platform and the train, that's that's got to go. Well, Chief, uh, I noticed that they do this. Uh, after midnight, and uh, I think it is very important to have a police patrol after midnight, and especially in my home station that is Atlantic Avenue Barclay Center. I'm not seeing uh, police officers from District 32 at all. Well, that's, AJ, that's a very busy station, and I agree with you, and I, I, I want I want you to see officers there. So I will take that back to 32. We have a brand-new uh, commanding officer there. Uh, 
Captain Hwan Kim, and I will mention that to him. Thanks, Jason. Mr. Thank you, Chief. I'll see you guys next month. Nice to see you, Jay. Can you hear me? Now yeah, can you hear me? All right, so yes. good evening, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Charlton D'Souza. Uh, I'm the president of Passengers United. And Chief, my concern is this. Uh, I was at the 34th Street Herald Square station on the 6th Avenue line in March, and this was about 11.45 at night, and a guy was on the third rail on the tracks trying to commit suicide. And we were there for almost 45 minutes, People made 911 calls. Um, I pressed the intercom, the help point intercom. No police showed up. And that station, every night, we're seeing people lying on the platforms or on the end platform upstairs, on the lower platform. And what I want to know is this. Can you please look in system-wide to see what is the response for the 911 calls? Because I'm getting a lot of complaints from the private security guards that are working for the MT, that when they see a condition and an individual is being disruptive or there's a crime in progress, they're calling 911 or they're calling that hotline number that they have and the police are not showing up. This is a major issue. Same thing with the train crews. When there's an incident on a train and I go to the conductor for assistance, the RCC is telling the conductor radio for police en route. But the problem is when the trains go down the line, there's no police. And this is happening overnight, especially I would say Saturday night, Sunday night. It's just horrible. So I need you to please address this issue. Thank you. All right, I, I will definitely look at it. 34th Street obviously is a major, major important corridor. Um, I, I can't really understand or huge explain complex. to that. It's a huge complex, but we have offices there 24 hours a day between 7th, 8th and 6th Avenue. So. That incident where they, you said there was such a delay, I don't quite understand that because 911 calls, you know, obviously we make great efforts to get to any 911 call as quickly as we can. But uh, I, I will, you know, I'll stay on that. 34th Street obviously is of critical importance. And the passageways, the passageways overnight, you have a lot of these entrances, like the 35th entrance that goes all the way to Macy's. There's drug dealing going on in there. People are selling drugs. So I think, you know, the MT and the NYPD need to work together to close a lot of these unstaffed entrances at night where there's no one over there. And you could get mugged, raped, God knows what, so. Hey, um, Deborah. Hi, Chief. Uh, I have a, sec a question that adds on to what my son said. When I go through the auto gate with my card, I tap it or put it in. People purposely wait and have actually shoved me so they can get by me. So what would so there once or twice a few of the officers gave me look like acting like I was one letting them in, but I don't I'm not happy about that because it's not fair to me. I'm paying correctly and I have a walker. And there are times I've had to use my wheelchair to get through. So can you train the officers to understand that it's not, what am I supposed to do if this big man pushes me? I'm only 5'2". 
and a senior citizen with disabilities. Understood, driver. Thank you. I get it. Thank you. Thank you. Andy. Give me a get, send me a sec, guys. Okay, there we go. All right. So um, this is just going to be a brief question for the um, chief. So chief, beginning tomorrow, piano at the park is going to be back. And this is why you see the background, of course, today. But my question is, are there going to be extra patrols beginning tomorrow and going into next week for the 42nd Street Bryant Park Station along with Times Square and 42nd Street Grand Central? So Times Square, uh, we, we actually have a, a transit police station, the, the transit task force in Times Square, 43rd Street and 8th Avenue in the station. The Times Square Initiative, or the TSI, is in, that, in those stations uh, 24 hours a day. The thing at Bryant Park you mentioned, I was not aware of that. That's Transit District 1. I will bring uh, that back to uh, Deputy Inspector Gorman, who's the commanding officer one, and I'll just sign that one. And who will follow up on this with me? Yeah, so, because the um, piano at the park concerts are normally starting on Monday the 2nd, and it's going to be Monday through Friday until the fall, and they normally begin around noon, 12.30. Oh, so they're in, they're in the afternoon? Correct, Chief. All right. So I'll make sure that he's aware of that. Thank All right, you. thank you. Yeah. Chief, oh. first of all, thank you so much for being here. But um, so, oh. something I've increasingly noticed on the trains, the E-trains passing by local stations, so there are often people at the, at the, at the far end of stations, like 67th Avenue, 75th Avenue. These are low ridership stations. Yeah. People who walk by there, and I see people smoking, lying on the ground. And, and I imagine that there are other crowd, crowd, things going on in these areas. Like, like back, back. So the elements, and I, I, I've said it many times, is we're greater attention to quality of life. We're going to, we have to do more. Quality of life in the subway system over the last few years has seemed to, whatever it's eroded, I mean, we're determined. Yeah, not just the subway. Everything else. Well, I get it, but you know, we're certainly determined to, uh, <coughs> to sort of to bend the curve, to go back in the right direction. So, again, if you see a call, please um, 311. If it's if if it's a crime, 911 for sure. Or if you want to bring it to the attention of the the train crew, then they can put over six wire. But what I don't want is just to, you know, uh, don't um, give up and, and walk by it. You know, let somebody know. Call 311, text 311, and then at least um, I instituted a new program last few months where I sent to every commanding officer every morning. They see everybody's 311 calls from the day before. So we could all, from myself on down, we're looking at every 311 call that came in the day before, and we're trying to troubleshoot, strategize and how to the stations that are definitely the ones that are experiencing critical issues, but even the lesser stations, if, you know, if they're smoking or upsets, we're all seeing that same job together. And that was that wasn't really happening before, but now we're all putting eyes on this uh, stuff. So uh, again, greater attention to quality of life. And also, this like follow up again, like you talked about how, like, like when the officers are on train, are they also looking at, especially for express runs, are they also looking at the local stops? Because I'm also, often seeing this, like, on express train, and by the, like, and I see this happening at local stops out the window. So, your question is if, a, if an officer is on an express train, do they look out the yeah. windows to see if what's happening on local stops? Yeah. I know I do, but yeah, yeah. we should be doing that. All right, though. Like, let, let, let me, me just. Let me just thank you so much. Um, you can tell from all of our comments that um, the subways are our arteries and yeah, veins, and um, they're the key to life in New York, and we'll be damned if we're going to let any thugs stop us from utilizing the greatest mass transit system in North America, that's for sure. Right. So we really, the... we really appreciate all that you and your people are doing, and yeah. we're willing to assist in any possible way we can. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
Thank you. I, I can't think of a nicer way to have spent my 35th <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you what. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, a new thing next meeting because okay. it's more we can talk offline. Uh, but I do want to bring up one matter of new business. Christopher is turning Jack Benny's age over the weekend. We all wish Christopher a happy, happy, happy birthday, Chris. Yes. Happy birthday, Chris. Definitely, you should be proud of them. She is. I am happy very birthday. proud. I know I didn't faint. Happy birthday, Chris. Happy birthday. So glad. You don't have to admit to any age. Yes, I did. I said Jack Benny. Jack Benny. Are you going to get a motion? You don't have to admit to any age. No, he wants to. I know. But that means next year.